Ich wünsche allen Hörerinnen und Hörern meines Podcastes Seelengeflügelt einen wunderbaren Tag. Mein Name ist Veit Lindau. Ihr Lieben, die heutige Lektion hat es in sich, sowohl von der geistigen Tiefe als auch von der Komplexität, als auch vom Umfang. Es sind nämlich tatsächlich fünf Teile geworden und deswegen ist es mir heute wichtig, eine kleine Erklärung voranzugeben. Ich arbeite jetzt seit 25 Jahren als Coach, als Trainer, als Autor und es gibt wohl kaum einen anderen lebenden Menschen, der mich mehr inspiriert hat als Ken Wilber. Ken Wilber ist ein westlicher Philosoph, für mich persönlich ein geistiger Titan und er ist der Begründer der integralen Landkarte, die heutzutage sehr vielen Experten aus verschiedensten Bereichen, Meditation, Psychotherapeuten, spirituelle Lehrer, Neurowissenschaftler, Systemforscher, Soziologen, Medizinern, Künstlern ermöglicht, erstens die Position ihrer Arbeit für den Einzelmenschen, aber auch für die gesamte Menschheit besser zu verstehen und gleichzeitig eine Brücke zu schlagen in die Wissensbereiche anderer Experten. Also für mich persönlich ist die Arbeit von Ken unglaublich wertvoll und deswegen hat mein Herz so hoch geschlagen, als er mir das Okay gegeben hat für ein Podcast-Interview. Und ich habe damals gedacht, okay, okay, ich habe vielleicht 20, 30 Minuten, welche Frage packe ich da rein? Und tatsächlich ist daraus ein berührendes, bewegendes, meinen Geist extrem dehnendes Drei-Stunden-Gespräch geworden. Wir haben uns sehr bewusst entschieden, alle Lektionen zeitgleich zu veröffentlichen, selbst wenn ich mir vorstellen kann, dass manche von euch immer eine nach dem anderen ganze Ruhe verdauen möchten, gibt es sicher auch Menschen, die sagen, nein, ich möchte gern, ich möchte mir gleich alles reinziehen. Was erwartet dich? Ähm, dich erwarten sehr persönliche Einblicke in Kens Leben, in den Beginn, den Ursprung der integralen Philosophie. Ken spricht ich weiß gar nicht, ob ich ihn irgendwo sonst einmal habe so ehrlich, so berührend über seine Liebesgeschichte mit Rea absprechen hören. Wir sprechen über Liebe, über Wahrheit, über Politik. Wir sprechen über den Stand der Menschheit in den heutigen Tagen, über die kulturellen Kriege, die wir hier auch im deutschsprachigen Raum in Europa haben, nicht nur in, nicht nur in Amerika. Also es ist ein wirklich sehr tiefes, sehr reichhaltiges Gespräch. Ich muss leider eine kleine Vorwarnung äußern. Wir haben es natürlich in Englisch geführt. Die Untertitel sind noch nicht raus. Wir überlegen gerade, ob wir das Ganze noch synchronisieren lassen. Also jetzt für diesen Augenblick ist es tatsächlich nur für Menschen, die Englisch sprechen. Wenn es euch interessiert, also diejenigen, die jetzt nur Deutsch sprechen, dann gebt uns doch mal ein kurzes Zeichen, damit wir wissen, wie stark das Interesse ist und ob sich das lohnt. Ihr findet die Episoden auf YouTube, auf iTunes, auf Spotify und jetzt wünsche ich dir möglichst entspanntes, waches Zuhören. Lass dir deinen Geist öffnen, denen wegblasen in eine größere Dimension des Verständnisses von unserer Welt, von unserem Leben. Viel Freude mit Ken Wilber. Dear Ken, thank you very much for the opportunity to speak with you again. It's really an honor for me. Thank you. So, so you are co considered for a lot of people as one of the greatest living Western philosophers. And um, I'm very, very happy that you give me the opportunity today not only to speak about your work with you, also uh, about, uh, to speak about the, the person behind The work sure so so your work especially uh, the integral philosophy has stretched quite a lot of minds and has given a lot of people like me coaches therapists scientists a very great opportunity to understand what we are doing and right. and and to to build a connection to to other experts so i'm i'm very curious can When, when you were a little child, a little boy, uh, was there any kind of sign 
for your calling or you 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 already were born with a big head <laughs> <laughs> yeah i spent um i was very precocious uh particularly when it came to science and so i mean like uh i was five or six years old and i was getting home chemistry sets and uh, I had laboratories and I was dissecting frogs and just, you know, the whole sort of scientific kind of, kind of orientation. And that struck me as, as the very best approach to truth. And I was fascinated in it. So I was reading really by age seven or eight, I was reading textbooks on organic chemistry and physical chemistry Uh, introductory quantum mechanics, uh, all these kinds of things. Um, some of the teachers in my schools uh, began separating me out and giving me different tests um, from the rest of the class because I was just too weirdly um, absorbed in this stuff and, and, and really, really seemed to understand it well. And so that went on through high school um, and I was, uh, um, I, I, I don't want to, um, I don't want to sound like this is, uh, bragging or tooting my own horn or anything like that. I'm just trying to give a description. Mm -hmm. the description was this young kid who was just highly motivated to learn, um, but also really just wanted to connect with the world. Uh, in any number of ways. So not only um, did I end up being valedictorian um, through all four classes um, of, of uh, high school, um, I was also in sports. Um, I was uh, elected student body president twice. I, you know, all, all that kind of stuff. Um, and so I had no... no uh, Uh, objections really to my childhood um, normal ups and downs but on balance I was an only child my dad was in the Air Force so we traveled around enormously I actually went to four different high schools in four different years um, so I learned to make friends very quickly um, and then I was also really sad when we had to move because then I would lose all those friends and and I would sometimes just sort of cry for days um, for that and all of that went forward like that and then when I was around 17 or 18 and I was getting ready to go to Duke University in the medical program um, I started coming upon books that had to do with some of the Eastern traditions of enlightenment and awakening. Uh, I particularly read D.T. Suzuki's essays in Zen Buddhism. And, and the response after that was... I mean, it was this extraordinary stuff and things like Satori, actual realizations of an ultimate ground. And, and for three days after reading those, it was a three volume set. And for three days afterwards, my response was, I was furious. I was just enraged. And the reason was I kept saying, Why did nobody tell me this before? Mm -hmm. Why did I go through my whole life and have no even awareness that, that this was there? You certainly didn't get this in Sunday school, mm -hmm. and you certainly didn't get it in your science courses. And yet here was, in essence, saying, okay, all of that stuff's relative to truth. That's all very important. But there is also an ultimate truth. And we're not just saying this is a metaphysical postulate. You can have a direct, immediate experience of this. You can have a direct, first-person realization. And I was stunned. I was absolutely floored. And that just sort of started a shift. Um, I still had enormous respect for science. 
and I still consider myself in some ways uh, an essentially kind of scientific thinker. Um, I want evidence. I want you know as much data as we can get to support a view. Um, but I also was opening up to all of these other areas, and that became just an enormously um, almost obsessive kind of drive. I began reading everything on all of Eastern traditions, uh, Vedanta Hinduism, Neo-Confucianism, Taoism, Zen Buddhism, uh, on and on. And that got me into the whole Western mystical tradition, which I really didn't know was there. Um, and I, and I, I was just sort of absorbing that. That got me into philosophy in general. Um, and from there, straight into things like psychology, psychotherapy. And I started doing a lot of these things. In other words, um, when I read about gestalt therapy, I'd actually go out and find somebody that was doing it, and I'd practice gestalt therapy. When I started studying Freudian psychoanalysis, I actually found a psychoanalytic um, therapist and and started doing psychoanalytic stuff with that. I found Zen masters. I started practicing Zen very seriously. I was doing yoga, Tai Chi. Um, and it was very interesting because I found something valuable in all of these approaches. And then the thing that started to confuse me is that essentially almost all of them fundamentally disagreed with each other. So something like psychoanalysis would say you have to strengthen the ego. And then something like Zen would say you have to get rid of it. Mm -hmm. And and I knew that there was some truth to both of them, but how, how could those fit together? And so that became about a 17 or 18 um, the driving question that began motivating me was not of all the major approaches and disciplines that human beings have, not which one of those is right and then all the others are wrong, but literally how can they all be right? I mean, they're already occurring. They already exist together. They're already arising in this universe, so they have to fit together somehow. Mm -hmm. And I used to say things like, well, there, ought, there has to be some truth in all of them, because no human brain is capable of producing 100% error. Or as I would put it, nobody is smart enough to be wrong all the time. So, so there has to be some, you know, some goodies in this. So the question is, how can they all fit together? So may I ask you, uh, in this time, uh, had you really uh, quite close spiritual teachers that you could ask this kind of questions or you, you went by your own? Almost none of the teachers that I was studying with had ever asked that question mm -hmm. uh, and none of them were pursuing it. Mm -hmm. They were still pursuing their own approach, you know, very sincerely. They were gathering enormous amounts of evidence for it. Um, so none of it was just sort of taken on faith or you know, anything like that. So in the very broadest sense, they had a kind of scientific atmos uh, uh, attitude. I mean, even Zen had a very sort of, okay, first you have to actually, I mean, Zen followed what I would identify as sort of the three great basic strands of good science, which is the first is you have to have an injunction. Um, you have to have a coon called a paradigm. And it's of the form, if you want to know this, do this. And so that was what coon meant by science having a paradigm. A paradigm wasn't a super theory that created facts, invented facts. That's sort of the way it was used, but it's not the way Kuhn meant. And Kuhn got so upset with it being used that way 
because people were saying, well, all I have to do now is just come up with my own paradigm and I, I have scientific proof. And Kuhn is going, ah. So he actually stopped using the term paradigm completely. He said, I'm not giving you that. And he started using the term exemplar. And exemplar meant an exemplary injunction. In other words, it was a practice that you did when you did that practice, when you did that experiment, when you did that action, it would bring forth experience, a data, an illumination. And so then you would gather that data, that direct experience, and that would help you form your theories. And then just to check and make sure that you weren't hallucinating, <laughs> then you would ask somebody else to repeat the experiment, if they got the same data, then, you know, it, you start to take it as, as being uh, probably real. And all of these various types of approaches that I was attracted to, all of them had some version of that. I mean, they were saying, okay, let's try this. Let's see if it works. We're not telling you that you have to believe this on faith. We want you to try it, see if it works for you, and so on. But they were still disagreeing with each other. And so for several years, as I was pouring through all of that, just asking the question, okay, how do these all fit together? How do these all fit together? Um, and then one day it just sort of hit me that um, it wasn't just that there was one consciousness and everybody was finding different approaches to that one thing. But the, there was a whole spectrum of consciousness. There was a whole series of bands or levels or waves of it. And each of them, of course, had a different color, different qualities and so on. It, but it, it was one rainbow, but still a spectrum. And each of these major schools were approaching a different band in the spectrum. So that's how they could all be right. They were correct when they were addressing their own band. But they screwed up when they tried to talk about other bands that they didn't actually exper experience themselves. So you can check that other band, but you have to use its paradigm. You have to take the injunction mm -hmm. that's going to put you in the vicinity of that cosmic address and then you'll be able to experience that event. But if not, you can't see it. You don't even know it's there. So um, that was a, a big kind of breakthrough for me and, uh, when I was 23. Can I, can I ask you about this? Yeah. Because there's one question, a question bothering me since years, you know? I mean, if you get the integral theory, it's, it totally makes sense. So I always was thinking, okay, was it a kind of process or was it kind of one moment enlightening experience? You know, I had always this kind of image, Ken is standing in a big room, he has all these different approaches in his mind, like in a very, very big room, and suddenly, bam, you see the, you see, you see the pattern, you, you right. know? Was right. it like this? Well, sure. Um, I mean, uh, any of the major insights uh, that I've had, uh, they, they always are a type of, you know, light bulb going on, that kind of thing. And, and it's a fairly distinct sort of little miniature Satori. It's just kind of pow. But there are all these things leading up to that. Mm -hmm. and, and the thing leading up to that, that first sort of major insight for me um, was this background question about, okay, how can these all have some degree of truth? How can they all be true but partial? And that would lead eventually to even having to say things like, okay, if, if everything is true but partial, then how about something like <clears throat> a belief in Santa Claus or a belief in the tooth fairy 
Mm -hmm. Or we could get more sophisticated and say, how about Zeus? How about Apollo? How about Aphrodite? Are those, are those real? Mm -hmm. And that would lead me eventually to the idea that there wasn't just this spectrum of consciousness, but that the spectrum developed. And, and everybody was born at square one and then would unfold through the structures and stages of consciousness that had evolved up to that time. And you could actually track this over history. So you had um, developmental geniuses like John Piaget tracking major worldviews that unfolded. Uh, to, to give a variation on his model, it was like from archaic to magic to mythic to rational to pluralistic to integral. And those turn out to be not just stages that humans have undergone in their broad history, but they're also, once one of those stages is laid down, then it becomes part of sort of a ground unconscious for human beings. So everybody born from that point on has all the stages that have emerged up to that point, and they all themselves start at square one. So even today, if we had uh, an incredibly integral culture that was driven through some very high integral stages, there are still people born at square one, mm -hmm. and they have to move through all of those. And there's no guarantee they'll make it. And so that's why we see, we'll probably talk about it um, a bit more, but that's why we see things like culture wars, mm -hmm. where culture wars are three very different value systems, um, sometimes referred to as sort of tr uh, traditional values, family values, often fundamentalist religious beliefs, that kind of thing. That's one value structure, amber. And then another called orange, and that's more of the modern, rational, uh, liberal, enlightenment values. Um, it has a world-centric morality, not just an ethnocentric morality like Amber does. And that was a big change when human beings went through that uh, historically. And then in the 60s, another major stage started to emerge, which we call green or pluralistic, relativistic. Uh, it's often called multicultural or diversity and inclusivity and things like that. And these are three different value structures. And essentially, they're all at each other's throats. And so that's just a good example of how for each of People at each of those major stages, they have um, a set of values and a set of motivations and a set of beliefs that are very, very real for them. Um, and then we have a next stage and its values are very real for it. The next stage, its values are very real for it. Um, and so even if you take something like Santa Claus is real. Now, for somebody at orange or green, that's not real. Mm -hmm. But for somebody at amber, it is. And, and so that, that's how we can even fit those kinds of beliefs into uh, a framework that's seeing that there's some degree of truth, at least for people at a various stage. And so that allows us to understand sort of the whole phenomenology of, of culture and individuals. And it's, it's set in a broad evolutionary current where we keep sort of adding broader and more inclusive stages and those get laid down. And if they work and they're functional, then they'll become relatively permanent acquisi acquisitions of the human race. And, as the next generation is born, they'll start at square one. They'll go from archaic 
to magic, they'll move into mythic, they'll move into rational, and then maybe pluralistic, and then maybe make that leap to second tier, which is sort of where we're at right now in terms of kind of the leading edge uh, and most interesting aspects of what's going on uh, worldwide, culturally. Yes, I want to come back for sure for for what's happening in the world right now. But right now I would like to know, so when you came out with this, with 23, I cannot imagine that all the old sophisticated teachers uh, told you, oh, that's great, now I can, now understand everything. Yeah, just the opposite. Um, it was kind of funny because... <clears throat> I had, well, when I was 23, I wrote up my first book, which was about, you know, this spectrum of consciousness. That's what the book was called, the spectrum of consciousness. And it put all this stuff together and explained these different dimensions, waves, levels of, of uh, consciousness each of which viewed the world quite differently. But my point was that the disciplines from all of these bands of awareness are important, and we have to include them all if we really want to um, address a full human being and really allow ourselves to develop a kind of wholeness that, that we can if, if we do something like this. And so I always thought that if you had like three approaches, um, major approaches to a topic, approach A, approach B, and approach C, and you showed how all three of those are absolutely crucial to understand the picture, I always at first thought all three of them will love you, mm -hmm. but they all hate you. Because you just demonstrated they don't have the one and only true approach. And they can't stand it because they hate all those other approaches. They spent their whole life dedicated to just this one. So it was a very mixed uh, set of reviews um, to Spectrum, to the first book. And again, I really was just a kid uh, when that happened. Um, but half of them, a little bit more than half, really, um, were people who were developing into these more integral stages of awareness. And they could see what seemed to them, anyway, to be a really important contribution. And so the, the reviews from those were just off-the-wall positive um, I mean, just so hyperbolic, it, it, was, it was ridiculous. But what I could see, even if I didn't necessarily agree with the literal truth of what they were saying, I could see that it had touched on this integral awareness. And they didn't see much of that, so they really appreciated seeing something like that. But they would say, I heard everything from... Uh, Wilbur's written a best book on consciousness since William James. Uh, Gene Houston said Wilbur would do for consciousness, which Freud did for psychology. Uh, half a dozen people said Wilbur's uh, Hegel. He's the, you know, da da. Um, uh, all the way back to I've been this excited since I read Plato's dialogue. I mean, it's just outrageous comparisons. Um, and then others were. I hate this. This is idiotic. This is a completely stupid person. And I, it, was just, it, it was wild. Um, but it did kind of catapult me uh, into a certain kind of attention worldwide. Mm -hmm. And I started to get a lot of people uh, coming and visiting. Um, they would all say the same thing. They'd knock on the door and say, oh, hi, uh, I'm here to see your father. <laughs> <laughs> I, I really was just a kid. Yeah. I go, I'm sorry, you're looking for me. Um, I apologize, but uh, this is it. Mm. Um, and so um, I just 
I just kept forward with that type of attitude as I just continued to extend uh, studies into more and more areas um, and ended up uh, essentially sort of doing kind of a book a year and it would bring it out uh, in uh, developmental psychology um, with the Atma Project and then looked at anthropology with Up From Eden, um, looked at philosophy and eye to eye and just that kind of stuff, just essentially trying to show how more comprehensive, integral, inclusive approaches really were um, not only useful, but in some ways are really mandatory for today's world. Absolutely. That's what was happening now is movement in that direction. Mm -hmm. And we would really never be able to go back. We'd never be able to go back and say, okay, there's all those other disciplines out there and they all fit together, but I don't want to know anything about that. I'm just going to take my one little thing and call it mm -hmm. the only real approach. You just couldn't do that with any sort of integrity anymore. Yeah. So that's sort of, uh, and, and in that regard, by the way, I, I look at myself as it's just one of many manifestations of this more inclusive evolutionary stage. That's that's coming forth right now.